The year is 2014, and everyone needs you to know about this hot new thing called feminism. Man, is it cool. It's like when there, when there's women... 2014 is described as a watershed year for the feminist movement before it's even over. Emma Watson speaks out at the United Nations. Beyonce displays it on a 30-foot screen. Some other things also happen this year. By this point, the movement, or at least the word has won endorsements from stars like Lena Dunham, Katy Perry, Amy Poehler, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, a really exceptionally 2014 crop of celebrities. You tell me people are asking Lena's take, I know exactly what year it is. During this banner year for feminism, I'm a high school student who is, how do I put this? Not a girl, not yet a woman. I don't really fit in anywhere. There's no social movement for asthmatic little twinks. But I stand in awe of my female friends and classmates boldly standing up for what's right, taking no shit and teaching people about the cause. Admittedly, I take some convincing, having spent a couple years as one of those annoying Reddit atheist types. But after several conversations with a few very patient friends, I declare myself a proud member of the movement. It was a great place to be, you know? I felt like I was learning something new about the world every single day through my friends or YouTube personalities or blogs like Everyday Feminism. Despite infamous levels of backlash, I remember it as a very optimistic scene, one I was excited to participate in. Actually, my first ever video essay was on the history of feminism in early 2015, which was eight and a half years ago. What am I doing? What are we doing here? <laughs> Awareness was exploding and the moral arc of the universe bent toward justice. When I was younger, I was sure that by simply listening to people and speaking out for what's right, feminists were destined to change the world. And man, do I feel stupid now. Despite the explosion of interest in feminism during the 2010s, despite the place feminists secured in major cultural conversations, pop feminism did not bring on the gender revolution I had hoped it would. In fact, I'm not sure it even prevented things from getting worse. Instead, it just sputtered and died around 2018 when most of its key platforms went dark. As someone who kind of lost track of the movement around that time, it feels like the world has moved on. Pop feminism leaves me feeling complicated. The places I hung out online offered this invigorating atmosphere I haven't seen anywhere since. The movement welcomed me in and taught me things about the world that still feel useful today. On the other hand, I also feel kind of ashamed, and I've grown to resent some of the people who drove the movement. Activism has a responsibility to the world, after all, and the most influential feminists missed a chance to leverage the movement for substantial gains. If, looking back, all the movement accomplished was to get a handful of women corporate jobs and book deals, what was the point? Why did they waste everyone's time? Discourse around pop feminism can get pretty inflammatory and I'm not immune to that. I just, I don't think that's anything that I would um, like. I don't really wanna be like um, a girl boss type of, that's not my thing. <laughs> the collapse of the feminist internet coincided with the collapse of a lot of people's faith in society and left many former admirers full of undirected righteous anger. It's tempting to take some cheap shots here about centrists or girl bosses, but I'm ultimately coming at this project from a place of love. I think the movement was inherently valuable and could have accomplished far more if it had set its aims higher. I think pop feminism succeeded in one particular way that'll prove instrumental to the next feminist resurgence. I want to avoid making the same mistakes next time because very few of us these days have the luxury to fail if we ever did. So strap in and strap on folks because the time has come to lean in and let loose. <laughs> Cringe. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Ah. Yo, it's Lynn, and I have to laugh. How can we need not be equal? We're like half. Like women are like half of the people on earth. And yes, they should have been equal since birth. Holy cow. This is such a meme. Thank you. This is the beatbox dream team. I'm so. From 2005 to about 2015, we saw a bunch of new websites break onto the scene and quickly establish themselves as institutions of the modern internet. Real prestige brands propelled by the growth of social media. 
Some of these sites were specifically feminist. Lots more were just liberal leaning and sympathetic to feminism. The Huffington Post probably being the best example. I was going to describe this decade as the blog boom, but it's probably better described as just the way the internet worked until recently. Sometimes there were big new websites everyone was excited about. Remember websites? What happened to websites? As it happens, tracing the downfall of pop feminism will also reveal why we only use like 10 websites now, but I'm getting ahead of myself. There have been feminist communities online since at least the early 2000s, but this period saw them grow into a bona fide industry with the birth of sites like Everyday Feminism and Feministing and feminist, and yeah, names were not their strong suit. But these blogs positioned themselves as a progressive alternative to the kind of things that were already popular online, especially news, pop culture writing, and US political commentary. The most famous of these projects were the ones working to spread feminism to a wide audience. And when I say pop feminism, that's who I'm referring to. The many, many projects that aim to get the mainstream on board with feminism by making it relatable to people without a background in activism. Many of these websites got readers in the door with articles on popular TV, movies, and music. I think I started reading them thanks to their wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Orange is the New Black, which was my favorite show at the time. And yes, it was because I wanted to be Laverne Cox, obviously. Marketing feminism to a wide audience presented an interesting challenge, considering how stigmatized the label of feminist used to be. These websites took an effective approach by honing in on the sexism people already saw in their daily lives and could name as sexist without much priming. Catcalling, beauty standards, earning less than men, these are things very few women enjoy. That said, many young women didn't have the language to explain their frustrations. Pop feminism offered us names for these phenomena and started conversations that revealed just how widespread they were. Rebecca Solnit's viral essay, Men Explain Things to Me, recalled the author's experience having a man describe to her the contents of an acclaimed book he had not actually read. A book that she herself wrote. Solnit's story and her theory of why this kind of thing happens resonated with so many women that it inspired the coinage of the term mansplaining which I think everyone has heard by now. Other terms that came to wide attention include objectification, slut shaming, rape culture, pink tax. None of these were new ideas, but they were being presented in a relatable way that offered women a shorthand for expressing their frustrations. I mean, stop mansplaining to me is a quick, punchy way to shut a person down. I learned these new terms either through the blogs or through people in my life who'd read the blogs, and they certainly gave me a new way to read the world as someone who was really bothered by the sexism I saw around me, but also found myself participating in sexism I hadn't learned how to catch yet. Words like mansplaining helped me to, as we used to say, check my privilege. Of course, I was not the main character of feminism. My enthusiasm was basically a knock on benefit. Its main goal was to make young cis women aware of the embedded sexism in the world, to show them how feminism applied to them and get them on board with changing things. The approach these blogs took has been widely compared to the second wave strategy of consciousness raising. Consciousness raising groups were almost like a support group meets an activist organization. A small group of women would gather and take turns speaking about their struggles and experiences, relating to each other, participating in a well, the original guide calls it a bitch session, with the goal of finding common threads between each other's stories and building unifying theories of why they'd all dealt with so much shit. After all, everyone in an oppressed position is kind of taught that it's natural or that they deserve it. It takes work to unlearn that, and even more work to understand what needs to be done. This has been a crucial step in many liberation movements, especially ones that have been held down by a culture of silence and normalization. Like recently, consciousness raising strategies have been used to build support for unions in the United States, where unions are ruthlessly repressed and stigmatized. The stuff's happening on like Instagram now, because even the most evil bosses can't read your DMs. On this front, pop feminism was an undeniable success. It made young women aware of their shared struggle and convince them that certain societal norms aren't normal. But the thing with consciousness raising is that it's a means to an end. It's only a success if it results in radical collective action. The fact that most of this went down on profit-driven websites was not exactly conducive to that. Let me back up a minute. But through the 2000s, there were kind of two feminist internets operating with fairly little overlap. 
One was made up of sites like Feministing and Jezebel and was majority white. The other was made up of the personal blogs of community activists and people organizing direct action, almost all of whom were women of color. Both had large, eager audiences, but at least in my circles, the latter appears to have been forgotten. The blogger Brown Femipower has been described as the most influential person in online feminism, and I hadn't heard of her until like a month ago. Her vision for the movement was highly local to her community. It was also inextricable from issues with prisons and borders and hospitals, because that's where the most vulnerable women tend to be. In a 2019 interview, here's how Brown Femme Power described the difference between her scene and the one that went on to dominate. I believe you make feminism important by adjusting it to meet the needs of the people who need it most, as opposed to others that said the answer was making feminism more marketable by making it sexier. When you go all in on fixing feminism's PR, you're bound to leave some stuff by the wayside. Feministing, for instance, was accused of making feminism go down easy at the expense of covering precise issues and their occasionally drastic solutions. Feministing's founder, Jessica Valenti, was profiled in major outlets and got several book deals. The same could not be said of, for instance, the many black feminist bloggers at the time whose pressing material concerns were decidedly less sexy. Their book pitches were turned down, their ideas appear to have been lifted by white bloggers without credit, and their frustration with exclusion from the mainstream was misconstrued as negativity, anger, hating. Of course, none of this stopped organizers from organizing, but I think about how many more people they could have recruited, given budgets and larger platforms. While the biggest feminist blogs would grow more diverse in the years that followed, White feminists had already set a standard for what kinds of issues were welcome in the mainstream. Writers of color who wanted to succeed were incentivized to adopt the same small-scale interpersonal focus, and often to write things to help white people understand race issues. Later on in this essay, when I talk about how the movement targeted well-off white women, this is what I mean. I'm not saying no one else was present, I'm not trying to erase anyone who struggled against the prevailing voices. I'm just trying to describe whose education was prioritized. Ideally, feminist discussion is used to get people on board with feminist organizing, but pop feminism broadly went in the opposite direction. The feminist organizing was already happening online, but it was sidelined to give more attention to the cultural commentators. As I remember it, people in the more liberal, white-dominated spaces believed that simply convincing the public of our ideas would be enough to change society. And in this way, that talking about feminism might be more effective than acting it out. The early 2010s were a less bleak moment, or at least less universally bleak. Back when faith in liberal democracy was a given and not an immense effort to maintain. The mainstream movement acted by the logic that cultural institutions are entirely constituted by the beliefs of its citizens. For example, patriarchy exists because there are lots of men who believe it's good, and if we convince them it's bad, patriarchy will stop existing. By this logic, you can upend your entire society simply by getting enough votes for your idea. If you spread your message effectively, you'll spark mass behavioral change, and the political machine will follow suit because our democracies all work awesome. I mean, people can't drink clean water or pay their rent or find a doctor, all things that everyone likes to do. But look at our new prime minister, look at his soft little face. Oh, he says he's a feminist. This mindset dismisses the need for any kind of radical or militant movement and holds that feminism can change the culture by simply producing culture, raising awareness, shifting the conversation, and trusting that the rest will follow naturally. To be fair, this got me really excited as a young feminist. The hope in the air brought on a wave of left-wing video bloggers who genuinely taught me so much. I'm talking people like Marina Watanabe, Riley J. Dennis, Milo Stewart, Hi Milo, Cat Black, Huey Hewitt, even Lacey Green. I still have a lot of love for these creators, and I think there's value in producing feminist culture. It only becomes a problem when we overstate its importance. When we pretend that shifting the conversation is what creates change, and not just one thing that helps make change possible. It's crucial to understand that the focus on raising awareness, like many of pop feminism's quirks, emerged primarily from its financial situation. The movement's goals were shaped by the goals of its top ranks, media personalities, websites, book publishers, and a preoccupying goal of those top ranks was to make money, whether that meant turning a profit or just keeping the lights on another month. 
At the time, that meant creating work that spreads by word of mouth, getting readers to send articles to friends and family, or better yet, rave about them on their public social media. If you're a website editor who needs a certain amount of shares to break even that month, what are you going to do? Well, first, you're going to convince your readers that sharing the articles makes a difference in the world, that simply having the right beliefs and voicing them will spur mass societal change. You probably believe this, but you also need to believe it for your job to even make sense. You're an activism poster. You need to convince people that posting can be activism. Second, you're going to try to grow your niche by adopting a really loose, unintimidating definition of feminism. You're going to tell your readers that even if they don't know the first thing about feminism, they're already feminists because all it takes is to be bothered by daily sexism. Here's how Jessica Valenti's full frontal feminism introduces its readers to the movement. Do you think it's fair that a guy will make more money doing the same job as you? Does it piss you off and scare you when you find out about your friends getting raped? Do you ever feel like shit about your body? Do you ever feel like something is wrong with you because you don't fit into this bizarre ideal of what girls are supposed to be like? Well, my friend, I hate to break it to you, but you're a hardcore feminist. I swear. These two strategies boil down to growing our website is morally good, which can help explain why so much writing on the more corporate feminist blogs was just respectfully drivel. Personality quizzes, pop culture writing with very little to say, and no intention of raising anyone's consciousness. Like if you were around at the time, you might remember the roughly one trillion articles calling actor Matt McGorry woke bay. <laughs> I ate this up, and I earnestly believed these articles matter. Their wide appeal could be held up as proof that they were growing the movement. At best, this kind of content subsidized more serious work. Shout out to BuzzFeed for using their content spew to fund excellent journalism at BuzzFeed News. Kind of a brilliant way to pay for in-depth reporting, if you ask me. I've just been informed that BuzzFeed closed their news division earlier this year. So now the content spew isn't doing anything. Man. The rumors are true. What they've been saying about me. I have to come clean. I, Lacey Green, am a feminist. What? You're a lesbian now? Man hater? Hairy armpits? It ain't so. Shh, it's gonna be okay. Those are just stereotypes. A persistent obstacle to the movement's growth was mainstream culture's image of feminists as being angry, radical man-haters. One of the defining works of pop feminism, We Should All Be Feminists, by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, addresses this image from the jump. That word feminist is so heavy with baggage, negative baggage. You hate men, you hate bras, you hate African culture, you think women should always be in charge, you don't wear makeup, you don't shave, you're always angry, you don't have a sense of humor, you don't use deodorant. Images like these form many people's first impression of feminism, which is a problem for obvious reasons. It dissuades people from exploring the movement any further and socially punishes anyone who dares to. So the most popular of popular feminist writing tasked itself with destigmatizing the word feminist and creating a new image for people to visualize when they hear that word. Key to the strategy was presenting fourth wave feminism as more moderate and level-headed than its forerunners. We distance ourselves from the imagined bra-burning feminist by severing the word feminist from its historical roots and taking it super literally. Feminism, the Latin femina meaning woman, it just means a person who supports women. You don't have to be radical or mean. Most of us are perfectly normal people. We were really preoccupied with not scaring anyone off. For example, I came across this BuzzFeed quiz from 2016 called How Much of a Feminist Are You? that gives you a point for each of the statements you agree with. Most of the statements are totally basic and inoffensive. I believe that men and women should be equal. I believe that a woman has the right to choose what happens to her body. Things only a real monster would take issue with. So just out of curiosity, I tried ticking zero of the boxes to see what would happen. And the quiz told me, you know your fair share about women's rights and suffrage, but hey, it never hurts to learn a little more. Now, I'm all for destigmatizing feminism, obviously, but I'm on the fence about how many of us went about it. Feminism doesn't just mean you think men and women should be equal. Lots of people believe that in the abstract, and it doesn't stop them from acting in sexist ways. The word feminism refers to a specific movement, a tradition of theory and activism that's accomplished a ton in the last century, that's greatly raised the status of women. 
When people describe feminists as bra-burning extremists, that's who they're trying to discredit. So to see people demonizing the activists who won you your rights, and to respond with, we have nothing to do with them, we just want equality, well, it kind of throws previous waves under the bus and normalizes the word feminist without doing much to normalize the movement. I think ideally we would destigmatize feminism by reclaiming the work that got us here, by showing people that the anger and radicalism of previous waves, as much as it gets vilified, actually serves a purpose. Sometimes you gotta stir shit up. With that said, I think there's immense value to getting more people to identify with feminists and to make that a core part of their identity. Like, at the end of the day, movements need people. If a broad definition was welcoming people into a powerful new wave that was like reducing maternal mortality and ending deportations, I'd get off my high horse. But instead, I think this approach encouraged people to stop at the word. Because if I'm already a feminist, and my beliefs are already feminist beliefs, I guess I'm good, right? To make itself more familiar and appealing, feminism was redefined as a matter of personal identity. Not a movement you participate in, but something you are. Maybe something you already were before knowing it. This shrank its battleground down to the scale of a human life and made its project tackling the sexism a single person can change without the need to band together, calling out your conservative relatives, standing up for yourself, raising your kids differently. For the women at the forefront of pop feminism, you know, educated white women who could vote and make money and get abortions, it was easy to imagine that any remaining sexism was stored in unpleasant personal experiences. Like society had already reckoned with its most serious oppressions, and these daily frustrations were all that remained of them. This is one of those ways that the early 2010s feel impossibly far away now. I don't know how anyone could believe this after everything that followed. In learning how to be feminists, many people made it their project to perfectly embody the label, how to live a feminist life which is not the same as how to make the biggest difference. The idea is that lifestyle choices are the most important thing in a person's political life. And therefore, that being a feminist is about keeping your personal choices in line with feminist values. To be a feminist was to be confident, self-sufficient, and unproblematic. This sounds semi-reasonable, or at least it did at the time, but actually it's kind of a disaster. Placing the onus on women to live a feminist life has caused certifiable psychic damage to many of the people who've tried. I couldn't ask for a better example than the titular essays in Roxane Gay's best-selling book, Bad Feminist, which I read for the first time in the lead-up to this video. I actually read decent chunks of five or six books for this video, including most of the iconic pop feminist works of the 2010s. Some were better than I expected. Like, Men Explain Things to Me starts with the essay on mansplaining before plunging into, like, the evils of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, hell yeah. Others were disappointing. For all its fame, We Should All Be Feminists is a book I'd hesitate to even call progressive. It finds the source of misogyny in the hearts of service workers and underlings, people Aditya and her friends held power over. None left me as conflicted as Bad Feminist. To its credit, it recognizes a lot of super real issues in the feminist movement and undoubtedly revealed those issues to a wide audience, but the solutions it proposes work in a very limited frame of possibility and end up being very loyal to the current oppressive state of the world. I think this book is the key to understanding a couple fundamental contradictions in the movement it shaped. Bad Feminist Take One and Bad Feminist Take Two are two essays about the impossibility of living up to the image of the perfect feminist. In the first, Gay takes on what she dubs essential feminism, which she defines as follows. The notion that there are right and wrong ways to be a feminist, and that there are consequences for doing feminism wrong. Essential feminism suggests anger, humorlessness, militancy, unwavering principles, and a prescribed set of rules for how to be a proper feminist woman, or at least a proper white heterosexual feminist woman. Hate pornography, unilaterally decry the objectification of women, don't cater to the male gaze, hate men, hate sex, focus on career, don't shave. I kid, mostly, with that last one. This is nowhere near an accurate description of feminism, but the movement has been warped by misperception for so long that even people who should know better have bought into this essential image of feminism. I feel like I should mention, Gay can't seem to decide if essential feminism exists or not, which makes it hard to tell exactly who she's criticizing. She says this idea of feminism as hardline and militant is nowhere near accurate, 
but then spends the rest of the essay criticizing essential feminism with real-world examples. Her first example is a writer named Elizabeth Wurzel, who's argued that feminists have a responsibility to be beautiful and put together in order to make a good impression on the public. Wurzel is also on record saying, quote, real feminists earn a living, have money, and means of their own. Oh, come on, guys, just have money. Stop being poor. Stop being poor. Let the wealth trickle down, let the money hit the floor. I don't think these have ever been mainstream feminist arguments, and they're certainly not coming from the militant, unshaven feminist she's referencing. But there's an important truth in her criticism. Statements like this, beyond being obviously ridiculous, point to a feminism that's wholly contained in one's personal actions. The perfect feminist, many women imagine, is someone who's liberated herself entirely by optimizing her personal life, which is impossible. In Take Two, Gay offers up numerous ways that she fails to live up to the imagined feminist ideal. I'm going to condense this a bunch, but the essay is available for free if you want to check it out. When I drive to work, I listen to thuggish rap at a very loud volume, even though the lyrics are degrading to women and offend me to my core. Pink is my favorite color. I used to say my favorite color was black to be cool, but it's pink, all shades of pink. I shave my legs. Again, this mortifies me. If I take issue with the unrealistic standards of beauty women are held to, I shouldn't have a secret fondness for fashion and smooth calves, right? I mean, I guess not. I guess it's just that none of these are a big deal to me, you know? We're not immune to society. Sexist expectations have burrowed into all of us. And that sucks, but it's more a byproduct than it is the actual problem. Besides, feeling guilty about our desires doesn't do anything. It doesn't even keep us from wanting what we want. So why bother? Surely a feminist has more to offer than supposedly empowered choices that don't affect anyone else on earth. Okay, speaking of all this, uh, a few days ago I helped my friend Costanza film a video that is about exactly this. It's about like women using false feminist allegations to come for each other. And here she is. Hey. <laughs> Um, it's a great video. It says lots that I don't cover here, so uh, check it out. I know Gay sees this kind of thinking as a problem too, but she can't seem to break free from it. She ends up affirming that these personal choices are important, siding with the essentialist she criticized in describing herself as a bad feminist for not being more personally liberated. More than anything, the essay is about forgiving yourself for not perfectly embodying your values. And there's the first big contradiction. Pop feminism wanted women to empower themselves and live by a certain feminist ethos, but the people it targeted were already pretty comfortable. Your college graduates, your married straight women, your white collar workers, these people felt like they were being asked to change a life they quite enjoyed in order to live up to the feminist standard. In trying to resolve this contradiction, pop feminist discourse spent a lot of time consoling people for not changing their lives, for wearing makeup, for wanting kids, doing the normal things expected of women in a sexist world. On paper, this is fine. Being child-free isn't the path to collective liberation anyway, but it's bitterly ironic that a social movement defined by personal choices wound up having to justify inaction as a feminist action. I can't tell you how many times I heard statements to the effect of, feminism is about letting women choose, so any choice I make is a feminist choice. This ends up being worse than the essentialism gay is criticizing here, and putting even more stock in personal identity. Being a feminist is about doing whatever you're currently doing, because feminism is about whatever you want it to be. You're valid. Don't even work on it. What does it mean to open the floodgates like this? To make room for just about anyone in the movement? Well, I've kind of buried the lead here, but Bad Feminist Take One is so opposed to a rich definition of feminism that it ends up becoming a lukewarm defense of one of the most clowned on feminist texts imaginable. Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, the then Facebook COO, the original girl boss handbook. Now, cards on the table, I have not read Lean In. It sounds like a bad time. And if I let myself read every relevant book, this video would be like three hours long. So I'm trusting Roxanne Gay's summary to be accurate. She describes it as a guide for rich straight women to succeed in the corporate world while also making time for their families. Gay doesn't seem to have especially liked Lean In, but insists that it has a right to exist and a place in the movement as a book that advises already wealthy women on how to get even richer. She writes, 
One of the main questions that has arisen in the wake of Lenin's publication is whether Sandberg has a responsibility to women who don't fall within her target demographic. It is not realistic to assume anyone could achieve Sandberg's successes simply by leaning in and working harder, but that doesn't mean Sandberg has nothing to offer or that Lenin should be summarily dismissed. Cultural critics can get a bit precious and condescending about marginalized groups, and in the debate over Lenin, working class women have been lumped into a vaguely defined group of women who work too hard for too little money. There's been, unsurprisingly, significant pushback against the notion that leaning in is a reasonable option for working class women who are already stretched woefully thin. Sandberg is not oblivious to her privilege, noting, I'm fully aware that most women are not focused on changing social norms for the next generation, but simply trying to get through each day. 40% of employed mothers lack sick days and vacation leave, and about 50% of employed mothers are unable to take time off to care for a sick child. Only about half of women receive any pay during maternity leave. It would have been useful if Sandberg offered realistic advice about career management for women who are dealing with such circumstances. It would also be useful if we had flying cars. Mm. Gay's key point about Lenin is that while the book may not be useful for working class women, it's actually misogynistic to expect it to be because we don't expect ruling class men to sympathize with working class men. She says, like I think she's saying, that it forces an essentialist role on Sandberg, policing her and punishing her for not living up to the perfect feminist ideal. God forbid women do anything. This line of thinking presupposes that being rich is morally neutral. It treats rich and poor as completely natural categories that have nothing to do with each other. Surely Cheryl getting rich doesn't hurt anyone else. Roxane Gay argues in favor of a stratified feminist movement where some writers teach rich women to get richer and other writers teach poor women to, I don't know, do whatever poor women do. It's not even separate, but equal. It's just separate and that's okay. Now, if you've made it this far, you probably see what I'm getting at here, but let me make it explicit. Rich people exploit poor people and most people are poor. Therefore, rich women exploit most women. Any movement that works to advance high earning career women is working against the rest of us. This is the second contradiction that bad feminist highlights within pop feminism. It envisions a movement that fights for all women, but some women are the enemy. Some women's interests go directly against the interests of the majority. People who advocate for all feminisms of the oppressed and the oppressors reveal a stronger allegiance to the current state of affairs than they do to any attempts to change it. Bad Feminist envisions a world where wealth still exists alongside poverty, and where feminism's role is to simply make poverty more comfortable. In The Rise of Neoliberal Feminism, Catherine Rottenberg argues that this strain of feminism doesn't aim to change society, but to serve as an instrument that allows society to justify whatever it was going to do anyway. Wars, border control, celebrity worship, advertising. All of these, and basically anything else, can be pursued in the name of women. Corporate-friendly feminism is obsessed with including all voices, powerful and powerless, because it has more faith in liberal pluralism than it does in any specific belief. It's pro-feminist, but not pro any specific kind of feminist, and it's therefore unwilling to take a stand except the most basic one. Sexism is bad. How about we don't choke any women? So true, right? Don't choke women! If we take another look at Roxane Gay's definition of essential feminism, quote, the notion that there are right and wrong ways to be a feminist, and that there are consequences for doing feminism wrong, we can see that a movement kind of needs those things if it wants to get anything done. Once feminism becomes a self-referential identity, where being one is entirely untethered from a person's political life, challenging an oppressor's status as feminist becomes policing, gatekeeping, or interpersonal cruelty. From this perspective, feminism isn't a collection of ideas and strategies we can use to achieve our goals. Being a feminist is the goal. It's not a movement, because movements work toward change, and change is divisive. Rather, it's a club you join to improve your confidence, have better sex, and advance in your career. By this logic, barring people from being considered feminists bars them from empowerment, from taking control of their lives. 
Why are you oppressing the CEO of Facebook right now? That's so fucking toxic of you. Honestly, to me, this was the fatal flaw of the whole movement. For as progressive as it tried to be, it was too focused on welcoming everybody to achieve any kind of deeper consciousness. It could never seriously grapple with the fact that our world is organized in a way that requires the oppression of certain women. Westerners enjoy cheap products because of overseas factory workers who, by design, will never be able to buy the things they produce. In my home country of Canada, we can afford more fruits and veggies than we actually need because they're harvested by seasonal migrant workers who get paid below a living wage and live in inhumane, overcrowded quarters. And let's not forget how much work, like, mothers and caregivers do for free all the freaking time. Our world needs that to function and they don't get paid for it. Pop feminism was led by people who were uncomfortable with the oppression of these women, but also benefited from it in countless ways and didn't really want their position threatened. The only permissible discussion of power was through the flaccid lens of privilege. Flaccid lens, what an awful phrase. Oh, just picturing that. Privilege, as it's usually deployed, can compare the challenges between two individuals or between two groups but doesn't require you to establish a causality. So we can acknowledge that people of color have it harder than white people, poor people have it harder than rich people, and so on, but never the role these oppressions serve, almost universally to give more power to the wealthy. Another essay in Bad Feminist, titled Peculiar Benefits, details Roxane Gay's childhood trips to Haiti, where her family comes from. She says that witnessing the poverty in Haiti taught her a lot about her own privilege as a well-off American kid, and showed her that some people struggle a lot more than she does. But she misses a chance to draw a connection between American prosperity and Haitian poverty, as if these things have no relationship to each other. When Haiti gained independence from France, following a rebellion led by self-liberated slaves, it was actually remarkably rich, one of the richest places in the entire Western Hemisphere. The American government saw this and feared that the Haitian Revolution would inspire American slaves to revolt next. So what did it do? It cut Haiti off from American trade or financial aid, starting the country down a long poverty spiral, all to protect the wealth of American slave owners. I don't know, obviously I'm far out of my lane here, but it strikes me as a missed opportunity. The focus on privilege at the expense of power is just another way the movement's ideology was held back by practical financial concerns. If you need to earn a profit on your social movement, you really want the rich on your side. I mean, they may not need you the most, but they're the quickest to shell out $30 for a book on allyship or tens of thousands for a workplace diversity training. Mainstream feminist ideas needed to appeal to people whose interests were in direct conflict with each other. And as it turns out, privilege theory is pretty appealing to the most privileged. It allows them to work through their guilt via charitable donations, personal reflection, and empathy with the oppressed. While we saw a lot of writing on feminist blogs about the most marginalized people, the bulk of it was written for the most comfortable, encouraging them to unlearn their ingrained biases and check out these seven things to stop saying to black women, or the top 10 questions working moms are tired of hearing, or five common assumptions you never realized were classist. We sometimes call these minor frustrations microaggressions, and to be fair, they are important to understanding the daily lives of a lot of people. But oppression doesn't exist because some people are rude, so making them act more polite will only get us a fraction of the way there. Misogyny will not end if we stop calling periods gross, classism will not end if we stop thinking poor people are dirty. If anything, the sign of thinking can make the oppressive structures in society more adaptable, more sustainable. It's like we positioned the guillotine wrong, and instead of beheading the king, we gave him a nice new haircut. And now he's relatable to the common man, and we can't remember why we were mad at him in the first place. I say all this because on that surface level, where oppression is contained in occasional rudeness, we won. Pop feminism achieved so much of what it set out to do in the 2010s. Many microaggressions are way less socially acceptable now. Like, it's been years since anyone asked me if I've had the surgery. Kristen Bell is bisexual on TV. RuPaul is bigger than Jesus. Pronouns and email signatures are in. Gendered language is out. With man flights giving way to crude flights. And so on. Feminists advocated for these things, and they happened. We've changed the culture by any measure conceivable. And yet... Things are the worst they've been in my entire life, and they don't seem to be getting better.
In 2015, the editors of the feminist blog, The Vigenda, yep, announced a hiatus that turned out to be permanent, describing running the blog as an exhausting full-time unpaid job. The Toast ended operations in 2016, closing out with a heartfelt op-ed from somehow literal Hillary Clinton. Everyday feminism slowed their output to a trickle in 2017, then pivoted to selling diversity and inclusion trainings, and then shut down altogether. In 2018, Feminist and Rookie both signed off. Rookie's closure was a real shame. I really like that site. Feministing.com went belly up in 2019. The same year broadly was absorbed into its parent company, Vice by which I mean they've published seven articles in the last four years. Bitch Media, an independent voice since 1997, weathered the storm as best they could, but eventually shuttered in 2022. And just as I was finishing this script last week, I got the news that Autostraddle, which I still read all the time, has been acquired by a company that is allegedly, quote, driving the queer revolution through products and services. <laughs> They, dude, they have, they have a gender fluidity tracking app that costs $15 a month. <laughs> it turns out there was just never that much money in blogging to begin with. And to make matters worse, the past eight years have delivered a series of crushing blows to the industry. I get the feeling there's some insider info I don't have access to here, but I was around when two particular terrible things went down. First, the infamous pivot to video. In 2015 and 2016, Facebook had some faulty data that drastically overinflated how long an average user spent watching videos on the platform. This made video look like a huge untapped market, an illusion Facebook was happy to perpetuate as they encouraged media outlets to go all in on video, even though they knew the data was wrong. Seeing this apparent gold rush, Media outlets started laying off their staff writers and building expensive video teams instead. Tons of previously text-based sites pivoted to video, most notably Vice and BuzzFeed, both of whom were major proponents of pop feminism. When the news broke that Facebook's analytics were wrong, those publishers realized they had spent millions of dollars expanding into a market that was dramatically less promising than they had hoped. Outlets gradually laid off those expensive video teams but generally they didn't hire back the writers either. The second terrible thing, this one's worse, but I don't know if it has a name. Basically, in 2016, social media platforms started heavily suppressing posts that linked to external sites. Maybe because they were under scrutiny for spreading fabricated news stories that radicalized millions into the far right, or maybe just because burying links keeps users on site for longer. Hard to say. Either way, this shattered the blogging business model because suddenly it became drastically harder to attract and hold an audience. The death of link sharing was bad, bad news. And over the past seven years, no viable alternative has emerged to replace it. It also came at like a uniquely shitty time for the feminist movement, considering Donald Trump had just gotten elected president of the US, underscoring just how vital feminism still was. So even though pop feminism was arguably already on a downturn by Trump's inauguration, the renewed urgency heading out of the 2016 election was undeniable. It was sure that millions of people's fear and rage would spill out in some way, that it had to be channeled into something useful. So what do we do with it? Oh, oh no, oh no. The Women's March was a disgrace to activism, which made it clear, if it wasn't already, that many of these people were simply not serious. The pussy hats were embarrassing. I mean, they were white-centric and trans-exclusionary, which is frankly impressive for a hat. The signs were trite and self-aggrandizing, and the goals, were there goals? Honest question. I mean, obviously it's good to stand up when a fascist is elected president, but as far as a practical response goes, all the Women's March documentation I could find revolved around first, winning the 2018 midterms, and second, kicking Trump out of office in 2020, neither of which has that much to do with a protest in January 2017. All of its ambitions worked well within the confines of the electoral machine, Call your senator, register people to vote, let the world know you aren't gonna take this. But in the meantime, kinda do take it. Like, be peaceful, have fun, definitely don't do anything the government wouldn't want you doing. The two clearest ambitions of the march were help Democrats win the midterms and help Democrats win the generals. You can't help but notice that both those things happened and stuff's still bad, <laughs> like really bad and steadily getting worse. And I gotta wonder, if this is what it looks like when you achieve your goals, why set those goals 
Why not choose better goals? In case it's not clear, I don't look very fondly on the Women's March. I don't really have anything positive to say about it. I mean, I think the energy it harnessed would have gone somewhere no matter what. And if anything, the march only channeled people's rage into something pretty useless. I mean, the march showed more faith in crumbling American democracy than it showed in itself. It affirmed that the existing channels of participation, voting and nebulously speaking out, were the only ones required to fix the problem at hand. Ultimately, the march and the whole of mainstream US feminism at the time pigeonholed itself as the moderate wing of the system that got them into that mess in the first place. This reminds me of another lesson I learned from the book, The Rise of Neoliberal Feminism. Before the 90s, even the most moderate feminism was an oppositional force, working to highlight all the problems in social structures. In the 2010s, on the other hand, liberal feminists took for granted that all societal structures are forgivable, from marriages to prisons to American democracy, and just tried to make them a little friendlier. The problems are bad, but their causes, their causes are very good. The Women's March was nothing new in the grand scheme of things. It shared an ideology and a logic with the work that led up to it, but its combination of massive scale and obvious impotence created a real emperor wears no clothes moment for me and I think for a lot of people. Even its urgent mass protest kind of read more like an excuse to dress up and live out a fantasy of radicalism so that when things went back to normal, you could tell your kids you stood up for what's right. That's objectively mean of me, but also I think it's true. I mean, a feminism focused on personal empowerment via speaking out was phasing off against a violent reactionary movement that just got someone elected God Emperor of planet Earth. At that point, there's no denying you've kind of failed. This is why we need to talk about power when we talk about oppression. If we ignore the very political, divisive reasons that sexism exists, we can never meaningfully challenge it. Hell, we can barely even explain it. Pop feminism encouraged people to engage with sexism in a way that never pointed to its root, in a way that made the world feel, to me, like a structuralist mess of disconnected oppressions say that five times fast. Its most widely discussed societal ills were things like sexual harassment and unfair expectations. Important, no doubt, but things that regular people inflict onto other regular people. This didn't really prepare us to deal with an organized backlash. In We Should All Be Feminists, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie offers an approachable introduction to sexism, which obviously resonated with a lot of people but the character of that introduction leaves something to be desired. In trying to convince us that sexism should be taken seriously, the author reflects on several of her personal run-ins. When she was nine, she wasn't allowed to be hall monitor in her class because of her gender. Later in life, she saw women she knew get harshly judged for being unmarried. Despite the booklet's numerous examples, Edith doesn't spend as much as a sentence on the sexism that's imposed by governments and economic systems. Instead, her focus is squarely on what individuals say and do to each other. We teach girls to shrink themselves, to make themselves smaller, and so on. You've heard the Beyonce song. Now, it's not a waste of time to talk about the misogyny that individuals inflict on each other. Of course not. Its impacts can range from unpleasant to traumatic to fatal. But in the 2010s, so many of us spoke about sexism like it was held in the hearts and minds of individuals who simply held the wrong ideas. Now today, there are many more opportunities for women than there were during my grandmother's time because of changes in policy, changes in law, all of which are very important. But what matters even more is our attitude, our mindset, what we believe and what we value about gender. What if, in raising children, we focus on ability instead of gender? What if, in raising children, we focus on interest instead of gender? My issue here is that while we should obviously get rid of sexist attitudes, how do we actually plan on making that happen? What exactly do we want to do? Pass a stop having sexist attitudes bill? We spent so much time on interpersonal frustrations, but they're so nebulous. The splaining of man, the spreading of man, issues without a clear, broad course of action. To use Adichie's example of how we should raise our children differently, how exactly do you get millions of people to just Start doing that. Can you really change an entire culture's habits just by speaking persuasively and appealing to their conscience? I don't know, man. 
I mean, I used to think so, but this kind of strategy has burned us badly in the last 10 years. Sure, you can shift culture if the culture is like pronoun circles and putting gay people in movies. Those don't threaten anyone's bottom line. But generally, cultures hold oppressive ideas because it's convenient for the people in power. When families raise their daughters in a sexist way, they're doing it because the society they live in depends on women doing heaps of unpaid, unacknowledged work. And so it's created a gender stereotype around that out of necessity. If the culture you're trying to change is what patriarchy uses to stay in power, you can't just ask nicely for things to improve. A backlash is liable to follow and it'll be decidedly more concrete. I could give so many examples here. Oh, you think women should just be whoever they wanna be. That's cute. I guess we'll just fucking ban abortion. Good luck. Sweeping cultural changes are possible, but they're never safe. They can always be recaptured to protect the interests of men and white people and rich people, because that's who's in charge. Take one of the most ambitious, admirable feminist projects of the 2010s, the Me Too movement. An unprecedented awareness campaign that compelled thousands of women to open up about their experiences of sexual harassment and assault in hopes of denormalizing this kind of violence. The Me Too wave started in Hollywood, but eventually spread out to the general public, helping survivors bond over our shared experiences and making it absolutely obvious that something had to be done. Building off this momentum, the Actors Union SAG-AFTRA made a couple important gains, like a certification process for intimacy coaches and a discreet reporting tool for actors who'd been mistreated at work. This is unequivocally a good thing clear positive impact, I'm grateful that Me Too happened. Even still, several key factors went unchanged. The giant amount of power held by studio executives, the cost of living in basically any city with a film industry, the struggle for actors to earn even a meager living. That's to say nothing of the vast majority of people who experience assault who are, you know, not professional actors. For the rest of us, the seismic shift we felt around Me Too was primarily a shift in awareness and attitudes around sexual assault. The tireless work of advocates helped above all to change the culture. And then, a few years later, the culture changed back. If you were online last year, chances are you remember the outpouring of support for Johnny Depp, a man who allegedly objectively abused his wife in horrific ways. Don't even try to come for me in the comments. I will delete every last one, so help me God. Since the Depth v. Heard trial kicked off last year, people who once publicly supported Me Too have begun to publicly support Depp. The conversation around domestic abuse feels timid again. We've heard a lot about how maybe we shouldn't just believe victims. It feels to me like Me Too's gains have been somewhat eroded recently, either by people falling for a concerted PR push or by men who see themselves more in an abuser than they do in his victim. Alleged abuser, allegedly, sorry. Ugh. Remember that feminism's cultural front came at the expense of radical action, suppressing certain women's urgent material needs in favor of building awareness of sexism. Consider that building awareness is exactly what Amber Heard was trying to do. The whole trial was about her op-ed that hinted so cautiously at her experiences of abuse, never even naming Depp as the perpetrator. Her trajectory is painfully familiar to me. Around the time of the trial, I rode the same awareness wave to talk about my own traumatic experiences, hoping to raise awareness and make a difference, only to find today's world no less violent than the one that hurt me in the first place. All this leads me to believe that movements that value visibility over actionability will trigger backlashes they are not equipped to handle. After 2022, and really after 2016, pop feminist goals start to feel completely absurd to me. I mean, the Bechdel test, really? It's like we were trying to fix a world fundamentally less broken than the one we actually live in. All the avenues to change that we encouraged, winning hearts and minds, advancing the conversation, showing up to vote, want us so little that couldn't be taken away on a whim. A lot of people spent the 2010s educating themselves on all the ills plaguing society. Maybe just sexism, but likely also racism, homophobia, transphobia. Before woke became a shitty epithet, getting woke meant learning how oppressions hide in every community and institution. And it was something a lot of us aspired to. I get the feeling there are a lot of people who train themselves to see problems everywhere and after everything we've seen in the past seven years, now find themselves unable to find any real solutions. 
The mainstream feminist movement promised us that it could solve our oppressions and frustrations, but it couldn't and it didn't. Think about where that leaves us, right? I've watched helplessly as some of my favorite people lose faith that change is even possible and fall into complacency because, well, it's all fucked anyway. This low morale problem has given fuel to some seriously resentful and reactionary strains of feminism that weren't nearly as relevant in the 2010s. I've gotten used to seeing the most oppressed people scapegoated for the mess we're in. Trans people blamed for gender roles, sex workers blamed for objectification, Muslim immigrants blamed for like anything bad that happens in Europe. This is what the people in power want, of course. Now, everything that's happened since 2016 would be rough on any social justice movement. But I think pop feminism was especially liable to fizzle out because it left so many people in limbo, aware of the problems in the world, but without a path to actually changing them. Naturally, lots of us looked elsewhere for a path to change. Bit of lily lore for you. I accidentally joined a Maoist party in 2017. <laughs> They didn't tell me, they didn't tell me they were Maoists. <laughs> but many more receded into undirected frustration with the political process. My theory is that pop feminism is partially responsible for this shift toward pessimism and scapegoating because it didn't finish the job. However, for me and so many people I know, there's no denying it got the job started. I made this video because I know that people are still with it, even if the feminist movement seems relatively dormant. If you're like me, you picked up some real knowledge in this era and still reflect on it pretty warmly despite all its failures. I think it's useful to harness those lingering feelings, good and bad, to reflect on where pop feminism succeeded and where it failed. In my last seven years of desperate thrashing about how change even happens, I can never feel sturdy about an answer until I really force myself to look back and analyze. What I'm trying to say is that making this video was like an intensive therapy regimen about some websites I used to visit. My biggest takeaway from the past, Jesus, like eight months of research, is that we need to focus on problems that we can actually target. As women, some of our frustrations just come from the ambient levels of misogyny in the room, influenced by so many culturally ingrained ideas that we can't really do away with them in one shot. This means no more frenzy about manspreading, Yes, it's annoying, but we're not going to individually convince every man to close his legs when there's a better funded movement telling him that doing that would make him a cuck. Is cuck still a word? Do we, do we still use that? Uh, it kind of... In my opinion, pop feminism's greatest success was that it spread far and wide. And it managed that because people found it relatable. It showed care for what happened in people's daily lives and promised them solutions. So as long as we're trying to reach people, I think staying practical and grounded in lived experience is the clear way forward. Along with, of course, actually being able to follow through on our promises. So how do we find those relatable problems we can actually solve? Well, when we talk about the situations of harm or oppression we've dealt with, we can learn a lot by considering what societal systems enable them and why. Not considering, for example, an instance of street harassment as an isolated event, but it's something that's been created and allowed to exist from the top down. This kind of analysis doesn't leave us looking around, wondering what to do next. It implies a clear course of action. Spending the year working on this project has forced me to confront my own feeling that words are just words and writing doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. As a writer, I thought this attitude was humility, but it turns out it was fear. Fear to harness my platform for good. Fear of all the responsibility that brings. Above all, I owe this realization to a book of interviews with the writer and filmmaker Tony Cade Bambara, who is a black internationalist feminist active from the 60s to her death in 1995. The line that's really given me a clear assignment is this one. As a culture worker who belongs to an oppressed people, my job is to make revolution irresistible. There were always people doing this from inside pop feminism, even when the money was elsewhere. I'm endlessly grateful to those writers and activists who dug down to the root and helped me as a teenager understand why sexism exists, who is responsible, and why it's able to persist even when women's rights look good on paper. So, in the spirit of that, let's spend a minute examining a couple times that pop feminist publications got it right threading from problem to cause, making solutions obvious, making revolution irresistible. After that, I'll chime in with an example from my own life as well. 
This won't take long, but I think it might be the most useful part of this video, so stick around. Pop feminism saw a lot of talk about the gender wage gap, but too little about concrete solutions. This article from Everyday Feminism hit the nail on the head. The problem? Even when they're doing the same job, women earn less money than men, and people of color less than white people. One cause? Businesses want to pay everyone as little as possible. Right now they can get away with paying women and people of color less, so of course they do. The solution? Don't let it be up to them anymore. Organize your workplace for guaranteed raises, transparent salaries, and clear paths to promotion. In 2016, at the height of resistance against an American pipeline being routed through sovereign native land, Bitch Media circulated this infographic linking oil infrastructure to sexual violence. The problem? Native women in the U.S. face staggering levels of rape, stalking, and abuse, 90% of which is committed by non-native aggressors. One cause? The oil industry sets up these things called man camps. It's like these vast trailer parks of isolated oil workers who then go out and serially assault women in the surrounding areas. Ever since the oil boom in North and South Dakota, some tribes have reported that sexual assaults have doubled or tripled. The implied but obvious solution, stop building pipelines and stop extracting oil by any means necessary. To take it toward the personal for a minute, with the expectation that you will all be cool about this. The problem, as I've talked about before, when I was a teenager, I was assaulted by the doctor who prescribed me hormones. It's easy to focus all my anger on the doctor himself as the person who wronged me, but so many systems had to fail in order for that to happen. One cause, I was getting healthcare through Quebec's public system, which is incredibly under-resourced because capitalism is in decline and Canadian healthcare is under constant threat of being privatized. Because of this, I could only find one doctor in the entire city who would prescribe me hormones without having to wait like a year or two. So naturally that's where I went. When that doctor repeatedly harassed and assaulted me, I stayed as patient for ages because where else would I have gone? To me, the obvious solution is an end to privatization and a drastic expansion of the public health system. My doctor was a shitty person who made the choice to abuse his power. But if the healthcare system was truly public, if it worked in the public interest, he would have had no power to abuse. The personal choice to mistreat, abuse, or assault a woman is almost always the final cruelty at the end of a long line. Fixating on the bad choices made by bad people lets all of those shadowy co-conspirators off the hook, which I don't wanna do because that's who I'm angriest with. The people who benefit from wars, policing, environmental destruction, and the endless spread of private enterprise. The ones who decided that women's suffering is the price they're willing to pay for their stupid little lines to go up. Being a good feminist, and yes, there is such a thing, starts with understanding what systems create and allow violence. And this is a healing process all by itself. It reveals to us that even the men we see as monsters have been contorted into that shape. While working on this video, I've given a lot of thought to the role of articles and media in social change. And where I think I've landed is that the responsibility of feminist writers is to organize the chaos of women's trauma into stories we can tell. Stories that reveal the beginnings of oppression, that empathize with us in the uncomfortable middle, and most importantly, that remind us that every story has an end. Thinking in these terms makes it clear just how connected all the struggles around us are. The environmentalist fight, the anti-racist fight, the fight for trans liberation, the feminist fight, a lot of us are the same people, and most of us need the same things. A concrete materialist approach opens us up to the power of solidarity, which is an infinitely more powerful tool than white guilt or privilege checking. As Audre Lorde put it, bricks in a wall against which we all flounder. They serve none of our futures. If we take this angle and acknowledge that feminism isn't an isolated little pet project, then I guess I get to end the video with some good news for once, because all this is already happening. If it seems like feminism has gone quiet, that's because today's feminists are busy getting their hands dirty. By my estimation, the movement is harder to identify now than it was 10 years ago because it's integrated itself more than ever into other justice movements. The busiest feminists today are working to build futures without prisons, without wars, without shareholders, 
because they know that sexism isn't some sheer veil over society, this residual old school oppression that only shows itself in brief flashes. Sexism is part of the existing economic system. It is required for that system to work and it's upheld in specific concrete ways every single day. The work is clear and some of it's already happening. It's basically impossible to market to boss babes, but honestly, we should probably take that as a good sign. A great place to keep up with the struggle is Lux Magazine, which has kind of filled the void left by all the blog closures. It uses the same strategies that pop feminism did to attract people, like a focus on personal stories and pop culture, but uses those themes as a jumping off point to reveal how people are effectively fighting back and building viable alternatives to oppression. The stories of survivors forcing their governments to invest in repair instead of punishment, of sex workers unionizing for better treatment, of mechanics warming their neighbors to socialism with mutual aid garages, hell yeah. All the while, we need to remember that these struggles are only the first step because the oppressed majority shouldn't have to carve out these little pockets of justice in the world. We should call the shots everywhere. Our ultimate goal is to win games that nobody can claw back from us. And what is that world, if not irresistible? Thank you. I'm very brave, thank you. Producing a video like this one takes skills in writing, audio production, graphic design, lighting, video editing, marketing, and for the love of God, time management. It's super gratifying, but it's also a lot, especially for people who are just starting out. If you have any creative projects you've been trying to get off the ground, I highly recommend checking out Skillshare, who sponsored this video. Skillshare is an online learning community that's home to concise, approachable classes on everything you need for a creative practice from tutorials for software like Photoshop or Procreate to helping you successfully sell your work online. On top of these practical guides, they also have loads of courses to introduce you to hobbies like cooking, journaling, and drawing for beginners, which is great news for me because I already work so much. Lately, I've been eager to explore things that I could absolutely never spin off into a side hustle no matter how hard I try, like going for walks. I kind of feel like I did my life backwards. Like I got good at the career stuff first and now I need to figure out how to be a human being. One course I've been enjoying lately is iPhone photography, which is helping me improve the framing and color of my pictures while I'm out in the world and got me really pleased with my little shots of like mostly plants and graffiti. Going on record here, this makes me happy and if you ever see me try to monetize it, something has gone horribly wrong. Please write a scathing call-out post immediately. The first thousand people to use my link or use this QR code somewhere on the screen can get their first month of Skillshare totally free. I really do think they have something to offer just about anyone. So thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. So I see all these people making video essays that are like two or three hours long and I conclude that they must be doing it because it's really easy and chill. <laughs> look at, look how easy and chill you are. I'm right so chilled out. Time sensitive announcement. I feel like we might hit 100k with this video. Ridiculous. Uh, two things. First off, we will be doing like a celebration hangout cooking live stream on this day, this day on the screen right now. And second, this means I will eventually get a silver play button, which is kind of fun. Uh, patrons can vote on where it goes. I'm really hoping they will decide to put it like above my toilet or something. <laughs> if you think I did pop feminism justice today, a huge way you can help me make more videos like this is by joining up to my Patreon. It makes it possible for me to disappear for a couple months and really sink my teeth into a topic instead of rushing to get new videos out constantly. Patrons get early access to all my videos, they get their name in the credits, and they get monthly production diaries about the glamorous life of uh, whatever I am. Thank you for sticking around and a special thanks to the following patrons. Marin, Ms. Horrible, Kira Williams, Duck Rose Chilies, Amelia Pena, Ruby Lando Pincus, June Staffrey, Cora Lee, Dan Lazote, Scott Sometimes Lucy, MJ is Gay for Spider Gwen, Eric Admonson, Jasperi Wertanen, Vivian, Arya Bend, Borger, Guillaume, James Ayers, Rose V. Dale, Rachel Ann, Arden Quartz, Catherine Ann McCloskey Ross. It's so hot in here and the AC is so turned off and I'm wearing such a sweater. Kiki, Superhawk610, 
Ben, Blair, Noah Dverstal, Sasha Karbachinsky, Fina Joliet, Stina Carey, Now Kiyoshi, Spellcaster Sugar, Alex, Sarah Melody Vinci, Blueberry Hill, Kaylin Aaron, NL May, Scatterflower, Marco, Tyler Bloom, Cassie, Momo, Non Anonymous, Alicia Stella, Aisling, Lillian, Rose Juliet, Ivy, Joanna, Cole, Joe Liss, Charlie H., David Bennett, Escher, Fox Oslander, Rhea Chapel, Chloe Jane, Henry Richuden, Hannah, Talia Parkinson, The Recognition Scene, Ali K., Myron, Ripley Gaindon, Wesley Potts, Meta.jpg, Tracy Renan and Tell, ZHL, Caroline Clark, Elia J. Scott, Zephyr Violet, Gwen Lofman, Toffee, Chris, Ariel Kamira Rose, Sophie, Maddie Doman, Scott Weber, Anemone, Melody, ZBS, Olaf Enneroth, Caitlin, Emily Martins, Jade Persuades, Inanimate Lotus, Marley, Visprin Dojos, Kelly Jennings, Samari Braley, Allison J. Sterling, Megahertz, Smaz Ruby, Kafuyu, Darla Butler, Anna Nicholson, Spider Perry, Sandy Smith, Vivian Taylor, Izzy, Taylor Hardy, Spencer Anderson McGalligott, Harmony, Jane Malcolm, Caroline Matheson, Square 44, Colin Coltrera, River, I hope. Let me know if I got that wrong. Celeste Veer, Clara Griffin, Dan Bennett, Sorceress Gia, Ricka Coy, David Straw, Frogsmore, Ash Juber, Celeste Blossom, Cannon, Emily, Callan, L- Luna is lovely, Quillworth, Olivia Grimes, Siobhan is too good for a free banana. Okay. James Conkling, Ed Yother, Nick Mugio, Paige Landers, Jamie Lynn Salmon, Matilde, Netherfield, Hannah Leishnitz, The Numeral One, Biz Anderson, Ben Chalada, Mary Wishart, Alex, Emma Casley, Liana Loves Snacks, Cadinger, Bryce, Edgar Allan Pup, Jesse Earl, Alexander Morera, Aaron Laura, Mid to Your Art, Amy, Gem Violet, Wimble Limble, Quinn Osgood, John Preston, Honor Ash, Brent Beef, Augie, Different Name, Jonathan, and last but not least, Erica Peterson. Do you get it? It's Fleabag. Not the TV show everyone's seen, the live theater production no one's seen. Is this a reference anyone's gonna get? Whatever. Bye!